On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including China finds billions of tons of water on the moon, robotic breadcrumbs for cave diving rovers on Mars, and space agencies struggle with licensing doctors for orbital missions. This is The Space Race. A new study put out by Chinese researchers has found an abundant source of water on the moon. Published on March 28th, the report details the analysis of samples returned on the Chang'e 5 lunar lander mission. The Chinese National Space Administration successfully carried out the operation in late 2020. A lander equipped with a drill and scoop was sent to the lunar surface on November 28th, landed, gathered four payloads of lunar rock and regolith, the dusty material that covers the moon's surface, and launched them back to a waiting orbiter, which finally took the materials back home to Earth by December 16th. The material recovered from the moon was filled with glass beads called microtectites. They are formed when meteors smash into the surface of an airless environment, which happens all the time on the moon. The heat caused by the impact melts the silica contained in the soil, but lunar regolith also contains a fair amount of oxygen. So this molten silica and a bunch of oxygen-filled dirt gets thrown high into the moon's sky. Then it gets hit with ionized hydrogen particles from the near-constant solar winds. The silica begins to cool around pockets of this reaction, and bam, we have H2O trapped in little glass beads, literally covering the lunar surface. The researchers believe we could extract the water relatively easily by collecting some regolith, sifting it to gather the beads, boiling them, and then cooling the vapor to produce water. And because the beads are common in all lunar soil from the equator to the poles, this is a solution that could be used anywhere on the moon. But there's more than that. The researchers have found that these beads are likely the cause of water reservoirs beneath the moon's surface that scientists have been waiting to study for decades. The research paper actually begins by citing the fact that lunar exploration has detected substantial quantities of water on the moon's surface for the last two decades. We've seen confirmation that water ice is trapped at the poles, where there's almost constant shade in the deep pockets created by meteor impacts. And experiments like the L.C. Ross mission in 2009 was able to help NASA verify that there is a layer of water hidden under the top layer of regolith. But according to this new paper, what NASA was detecting was likely a concentrated layer of these beads. The researchers believe that over time, the microtectites created by meteor impacts get buried under the top layers of lunar dust and slowly work their way under the surface. At the right temperatures, the beads then slowly release their trapped water, and since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, the temperature fluctuates severely and regularly, even at the equator, swinging from 120 degrees Celsius in the day to negative 130 degrees Celsius at night, and it can get even colder at the poles. So this regular change in temperature has a regenerative effect on the reservoir of underground water NASA has been detecting on the moon. And this leads to a couple of conclusions. First, this is unfathomably cool. Finding out that the moon has a refreshable water source created by the energy from meteor impacts is just a wild reality to find ourselves in. It means that we can start to plan for more permanent habitation on not just the moon, but other airless planets, as this process very likely occurs everywhere that's hit by solar winds and meteorites. But it also means that we are not just restricted to trying to set up a habitat at the poles of these worlds either, opening up the whole surface to explore. Secondly, this means that we have a steady way of producing not just water, but oxygen for breathing and hydrogen for fuel. We already knew that lunar regolith contained lots of hydrogen and oxygen before, and experiments were being planned to figure out how to get those elements out by other means, but this is an extra source of those important elements, which means that the moon is an even more stable base of operations than we thought it could be. The researchers say that more tests need to be done before they can confirm the process for extracting water from the glass beads, but this discovery really opens up the moon for exploration, habitation, and, much more importantly, a base of operations for our exploration of the rest of the solar system. 
Launching rockets from the moon is a much easier proposition than trying to get them through the Earth's thick atmosphere and heavy gravity. Given enough time, our moon could end up being a very important hub for the next leg of the new space race. University of Arizona researchers are developing a way for rovers to explore caves on distant planets using Wi-Fi breadcrumbs to keep from being lost. Lead researcher Wolfgang Fink describes the idea as the robots using Hansel and Gretel style breadcrumbs. He says, In our scenario, the breadcrumbs are miniaturized sensors that piggyback on the rovers, which deploy the sensors as they traverse a cave or other subsurface environment. It's actually a pretty simple solution, in concept at least. As the robots spread out, they drop little devices behind them at regular intervals. These act like communication relays, almost like little Wi-Fi hubs which allow the rovers to talk to each other. From there, their programming takes the wheel and they explore what they can. And to make sure the data gets back to the Earth, the flock of rovers will have a mother unit, a robotic hub that relays the data from the cave divers back to Earth. Fink says that this mother will normally just passively collect the data, but can also be used to directly control one of the offspring rovers should the situation call for it. The little exploration drones themselves would need to be fitted with light-detecting LiDAR sensors to help find their way, but also a robust algorithm that would govern their search patterns and allow them to compensate if gaps are created in their exploration by the loss of a drone. This is because they are designed to be expendable. Fink and his research team believe that it would be a waste of resources to try and recover these robots once they head into a cave. So they'll be designed to get as far as they can and then be abandoned. Controlling robotic rovers, drones, and landers on distant planets has always been tricky. Signals from Earth to Mars take 40 minutes or so just to make the journey and back, so communicating is a slow process. But with missions being planned for distant worlds like Saturn's moon Titan and even other solar systems, we are finding ourselves in need of better automation solutions in order to deal with signal times in the realm of hours, days, or even years and the research team believes this system has applications for more than just caves. Titan, for instance, has extensive lakes that could be explored this way as well. Jupiter's moon Europa has a vast ocean underneath its icy shell. These situations are guaranteed to make it difficult for any automated missions to keep contact with Earth, but a cheap system of communication breadcrumbs could be a simple way to solve that problem. This new space race is being led by an explosion of new commercial agencies, and industry experts are beginning to talk about how we need to change our current systems to support this growth. One of the biggest questions being asked right now is, how are we going to certify new doctors for space work? Right now, most agencies use a system of older legal frameworks, which usually results in only current or former military personnel being cleared for this job. NASA, for instance, has been using officers they call flight surgeons, medical professionals who not only have extensive training in multiple fields like neurology and family medicine, but also are required to be certified for aerospace medicine, which is typically a military area of study. All of these extra requirements mean that a NASA flight surgeon typically has about 12 to 14 years of training, which might sound a little too stringent, but if you think of what the job needs from these doctors, it makes sense. Spaceborne medical professionals have to learn many branches of medicine and stay up to date on a host of new technologies and treatment protocols, because if anything goes wrong in orbit, they are the only people who can help. It's not a whole lot of use to have a specialist on board if they can only treat one type of illness or injury. Currently, companies like SpaceX hire NASA-certified flight surgeons when they have need of extended crew missions, like they did during Demo 2 when they brought Dr. Anil Menon along. But it's likely not surprising to hear that there's a bit of shortage of trained and certified flight surgeons available, and with this rapid expansion of space operations looming in our future, something needs to be done about this very quickly. To their credit, several organizations have been trying to find ways of speeding up this process. In February, for instance, a study from Western University in Canada looked into developing one international certification framework to license physicians for orbital medicine. 
The study focused on how restrictive Canadian law was specifically, with doctors being required to hold a license for each province they need to practice in, but the study notes that this is a similar issue with certifying flight surgeons the world over. They identify the problem as being mostly with the legal frameworks we have in place from the spaceflight industry's roots of being run by the military or government. There are plenty of doctors with the required experience, but not so many that meet the strict requirements of board certification. There's not a clear path for creating a universal licensing system yet, but the study concludes by saying that it's not a question of if this will happen, only when. Commercial missions are going to keep growing in number, and if we are going to keep space travelers safe, we are going to need to certify doctors to travel with them. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.